Okay, so we were talking about cytoskeletons, which is made out of small tubes called microtubules and um, different size filaments, microfilaments, intermediate filaments. And so this last little bit was about all the different things that the microtubules do. So um, they, we talked about they help with the spindle, remember of cell division, uh, and now we're going to look at the that they actually are, make up what's called the cilia and flagella that aid in, in movement. So they control the beating of flagella, flagella and cilia, uh, and <coughs> those are extensions that project from only some cells. Not all cells have them. Cilia and flagella differ in their beating patterns uh, and so they but they both aid in movement so flagella look like this where they're more tail like and long this particular picture is of <coughs> a human sperm cell is the cell that has a flagella um, some unicellular organisms have flagella that aid in their movement through like fresh water and so on Sometimes there's one flagella, sometimes there's two coming off of there, uh, but they um, help with the, the movement. And then cilia is a little bit different. They're shorter and there's a lot more of them. So this is a picture of cilia protruding from a cell. So you can see that they're kind of hair-like. We're going to look at the unicellular organism, the cilia, would be like this, look like this, like little hairs coming off of the organism. And those hairs uh, 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 move, this is called a power stroke, and a recovery stroke goes back, and then it keeps on going back and forth, but they all move kind of in unison to help move the organism. So both of them are aiding in movement. And so, uh, like for the human sperm, uh, that's movement to, to fertilize an egg. I wanna just point out cilia, um, cilia, there are cilia in some of our cells as well as in our human body. Uh, it doesn't have to be a unicellular organism. So let me give an example. I'm going to draw a little picture here of our trachea. Here's what the trachea is in your body. It's here. It's your windpipe, all right? So it's when you breathe in through your nose or your mouth, the air goes to your windpipe or your trachea, and that's what leads down eventually into your lungs. And so your trachea, um, so I'm gonna put here, here's the windpipe here, here's your trachea, it has a, so it's circular like this, but the cells lining it have a thickness. There are cells, all right, so there's a thickness to that. Um, and so there are cells lining the inside here, and this is where your air is. And the cells lining us, our, our trachea, I'm gonna put in a different color, well, I guess I don't have to put in a different color here, have cilia on just the one side. So there's, I'll just do it on some of them here. So that's the cilia. And so notice there's not cilia where the cells meet. There's not cilia on the other side. It's just on one side of that particular cell. And um, when we think about um, uh, when you breathe in, when you breathe in air. So I put here air. Breathing in molecules, gas molecules, oxygen, and so on and so forth, but you're also breathing in anything that's floating around in the air. So, so that could be dust, pollen, bacteria, <coughs> viruses, the skin cells of the person you're sitting next to that are constantly flaking up. All of that stuff is flo floating around in the air, and you are breathing that in. I know, just a <laughs> gross shot for a minute. And so... Do you suppose you want that to get down into your lungs? You don't want the person to your skin cells clogging up your lungs. So, <laughs> so what happens is your trachea on top of that cilia, there's a lining of mucus. Now mucus, that's, that's getting better and better, just wait. And so the mucus is, mucus, think about mucus, you know, in your nose and so on. Sticky, right? All right, very it's sticky. What happens is that mucus is there for a reason, so that when you breathe in the air with all that other stuff in it, it lines, you know, so it'll go to the back of your throat and then lines your trachea and all of that other stuff, the skin cells, the viruses, and so on, stick to that mucus, so they stick to it. And so the purpose is so that when it gets, the air gets down to your lungs, it's kind of cleaned out the air and got rid of all of those particles that you don't want in your lungs. Now the thing is, is that you don't want all that stuff sticking around in your trachea either. 
in comes the cilia. So the cilia involves movement, right? Well, for a unicellular organism, it's to move from one place to another. The cells in your trachea stay put. They're not moving around. But what the cilia do, cilia do is they still move, um, and they move, but what they're gonna move up to the back of your throat is all of the mucus with all that stuff stuck to it. So it moves it up to the back of your throat, and then guess what you do? You swallow it, because there's another tube called the esophagus that leads to your stomach and then your stomach will digest it and get rid of all of those the bacteria and so on and so forth okay and so when you think that what you're swallowing is just saliva you're swallowing all this other stuff too all right and so 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 that's an example of another use of cilia not for movement of the cell itself but it's used the cell is moving other things um, to help <coughs> the organism, the, the whole human. What about like phlegm and stuff like that? What about it? Well, like, is there like a difference in a way? Well, phlegm is mucus, yeah, you just produce more okay. mucus. It's yeah. mucus in the back of your throat or something? Yes, yes. Okay. so you start producing more, yes, yes, yes. So, I meant phlegm, <laughs> mucus, lining at the same consistency. Okay. All right, kind of, all right. All righty, woke you up now. All right, so that's your cilia. <coughs> the last thing is the cell walls. And we've already talked a little bit about the cell walls of plants. Um, the extracellular means outside of the cell, the very outermost structure. And that's one of the big features that distinguishes plant and animal cells because animal cells do not have a cell wall. But other things also have cell walls. Um, some, ba the bacteria, prokaryotes, fungus, um, the fungi have cell walls, uh, fungi have chitin in their cell walls, whereas plants have cellulose, and there are some eukaryotes, unicellular organisms that have cell walls. So plants aren't the only thing. So basically it protects the plant cell, helps to keep its shape, and then prevents excessive uptake of water. Let me talk a minute about what I mean by prevents excessive uptake of water. So if we look at a plant cell, the outermost part is the cell wall. So here's the wall. Right underneath the wall, you have the cell membrane. So this is the cell membrane, this is the membrane. <clears throat> and so what happens is, <coughs> is remember that you have, um, what's the big, structure that takes a good portion of the plant vacuole. the vacuole and so that contains water it holds water it holds pigments so the storage place but this is where water um, goes and as this vacuole so this right here is the, the central vacuole it's called as it fills with water so if you have a bunch of water coming into the cell this central vacuole is going to kind of expand like a balloon and what it's going to do is it's going to put pressure on the cell wall so as it as this fills up with more and more water it's going to be filled up and it's going to stand up very very straight um, but what happens is that there will come a time where it can't fill up anymore because the cell wall is so strong that it won't stretch out anymore. So therefore, if there's no more room for water and the cell wall won't stretch anymore and expand anymore, then no more water can go in the cell. So the cell wall is very, very tough that no matter what, that cell is never gonna fill up with enough water where it's going to explode. And so um, that is different than our cells. Our cells do not have a cell wall. So if you put our cells in a situation, we'll talk about this next chapter, where water keeps on going into it, we only have a cell membrane. The cell membrane, we're gonna learn, has a consistency of like salad oil. <coughs> so salad oil, if you think of a bubble of salad oil, that's not very sturdy. So if water keeps going into the cell, eventually it'll expand a little bit. What, what, but what's gonna happen to that cell? It's going to explode. The cell wall prevents it. So that's what it means by prevents excessive uptake of water. And so plant cells are made of those cellulose fibers. We talked about that in chapter five. Uh, and it gives it a very strong. And this is a picture of the cell walls. All right, so a big central vacuole um, and so on. All right. <coughs> 
and that is chapter six. All right, so we're going to move right on to chapter seven because it goes right with this. Chapter seven is all about one particular part of the cell, and that is the cell membrane. So we're going to learn a little bit more in depth about the cell membrane. The first part of chapter seven talks about structure and purpose of the cell membrane, which we kind of did a little bit. And then the rest of the part of the chapter goes with how things move in and out of the cell. So specifically with transport of substances uh, in and out. So we're going to learn about uh, or review about diffusion, osmosis, and those words ring about here on the outside the extracellular matrix so here we have the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell and so <coughs> you have your lipid bilayer and your proteins some proteins go through the, the lipid bilayer some are just on the inside of it they're called peripheral proteins there and <coughs> these guys here let's just review this glycolipids and glycoproteins Do you guys remember what if you see the word glyco in front of something what it refers to a sugar, all right, carbohydrate. And so this right here, notice the bracket, is a glycoprotein. This is the protein sticking out. If we were to go in there and look at it, that protein would be going right through the membrane like this protein here. So it's a glycoprotein and then the glycolipid, they highlight the whole lipid with the carbohydrate chain coming off. Do you guys remember, what's the analogy I use with the carbohydrate chains coming off of these? Do you remember, Megan? Yeah, is ID tag. So it's how to tell cell type in, um, from one type of cell to another or from one organism to another. And so, <coughs> so then notice then that these proteins here are connected to these fibers of the extracellular matrix. So some of the fibers are, these guys always remind me of, they look like little worms. And these guys are more fibrous here and um, there's an intermediate size. These are all proteins. And the extracellular matrix is, is connects one cell to another. So I'm gonna draw up here because this is one cell inside, outside. Let's put the membrane of another cell here. So this is another membrane of another cell. What I mean by another membrane is a lipid bilayer, proteins embedded, all right? I'm just not gonna draw the lipid bilayer for the whole thing. But what I wanna point out is, is just like this cell is connected to the fibers of the extracellular matrix, this cell will also be connected to those fibers as well. All right, I'm just gonna draw in there. And so what happens is, is that um, in animal cells, uh, the cells are not glued together. There's space between the cells, but the cells are connected through this network of fibers, all right, called the extracellular matrix. And so that kind of gives you an idea. So therefore, water is in the, so this is called the extracellular fluid, like the blue stuff on the outside. And it has water and different molecules where things can diffuse into and out of these cells or one cell can release something and it goes to the other cell and so on. And so, so that's new. 
On the inside, let's look on the inside here. Here's the microfilaments of the cytoskeleton. So remember the cytoskeleton um, provides kind of shape and so on, and that's, that's connected to the membrane as well via these um, proteins. And the last thing I wanted to point out that's new that we're gonna talk about its purpose today is cholesterol. So here are these cholesterol. These are all these right here, cholesterol molecules. Cholesterol. What macromolecule is cholesterol? Is it a protein, a lipid, a carbohydrate, a nucleic acid? Just remember what cholesterol, what category it falls under? Lipid. Yes, and you went with the right one. Um, lipid, it's a type of lipid, it's unique. And then if you look at that picture, there are four fused rings. So um, uh, remember, this is the one where most people uh, confuse it with a carbohydrate because you see the rings um, but they're fused meaning that they each share a side and so <coughs> so we're going to talk about the cholesterol very important part of the membrane uh, and so on so what are the functions <coughs> of the membrane protects the cell provides a boundary between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell can regulate the passage of molecules or materials in and out of the cell. We call that selectively permeable. Or what's another way, have you guys ever heard of it called semi-permeable? That means the same thing. So either way, if it's written, it's caught talking about the same thing, which means that it's selective about what it allows through. And so we're gonna talk about um, what makes it selective. Receives information that permits the cell to respond to external stimuli. So what does, in the world does that mean? <clears throat> what that means is, I'm gonna draw a little cell here. So here's the lipid bilayer, here's the protein, lipid bilayer, and here's the rest of the cell. <clears throat> so it says it receives information that permits the cell to respond to external stimuli. So that external means outside the cell. So an example of this, is a hormone. So let's say this is a hormone that binds to a cell. And remember, a hormone is produced, um, a molecule that's produced in one part of the body that travels to the bloodstream and goes to another part of the body to communicate. So it's two places, two cells in very different parts that can communicate with one another. They don't talk, they communicate through chemical signals, molecules. So one part of the body releases this molecule, it goes through your bloodstream and then goes to another part of the body and that, they call that a hormone and it, how does it communicate with the cell? It usually binds to proteins, so that's what it's binding to a protein in the membrane. And then that usually changes the protein shape and therefore it can act as an enzyme or um, it speeds up a certain reaction. And what that does is cause some kind of change to happen inside that cell. So therefore, the, the, the cell in another whole part of the body has communicated with a different part of the body through that chemical signal. All right, so that's what that means. So the membrane is important with that. It helps to maintain relationships with neighboring cells. You guys okay over here? Yeah, we spill? Okay. Yeah, I'm fine, don't worry. Are you sure? It only went First. out my jacket. Is that it? <laughs> That's so, important though. Yeah. Yeah, and of course we have the world's worst. Thank you so much. Yeah. Here's this. Here. with neighboring cells that's going back with the extracellular matrix and how they're connected and then we're going to see it helps to facilitate cell movement let me give an example of that an example would be the amoeba you guys heard of an amoeba it's a little unicellular organism that lives um, uh, in water and the amoeba is unique in that it doesn't really have a shape and so if you look at one amoeba and you look at another, there are different shapes and amoeba always changes its shape. But how an amoeba moves is in part help uh, with this, the cell membrane. The cytoplasm inside, what the amoeba does is it, it 
makes all the cytoplasm flow in one direction. So it pushes the cytoplasm to one side of the cell. So what that means is the cell starts to change shape. So the cell starts to have a protrusion here because the cytoplasm is being pushed against the cell membrane and the cell membrane protrudes out. And they call this a pseudopod, which literally means false foot. And so what happens is as it pushes that cytoplasm, it has this false foot sticking out. It adheres to whatever surface and then it pulls up, all right? And then it, then it pushes the cytoplasm and so on and so forth, and that's how it moves. And so, <clears throat> so the membrane is helping by moving, uh, helping the cell to move by protruding and so on and so forth. All right, so that's an example. And then transmits nerve impulses. Um, this is, this only happens in neurons. Neurons are a special kind of cell of your nervous system. We'll spend a whole chapter on that. <laughs> and this picture is showing you, first of all, is this a plant or an animal cell? Animal, right? And this picture is showing you the, a generic animal cell has a flagella, not all animal cells have that, but I just want to point out this part right here. This, um, uh, these are called microvilli. The, this is when the cell surface folds like that. That's to increase what? Increase surface area. Not every cell has those. It depends upon what type of cell you're talking about and what the job of the cell is and so on. So for instance, in us, we have microvilli in our digestive system, in our small intestine. Why do we have it in our small intestine and not in other places of the digestive system? Because of the job of the small intestine. The small intestine is the last not the last organ, but it's where your digested food, so all your food gets digested, and in the small intestine, all that digested food, is that's where it enters the bloodstream. So it has to diffuse through. The small intestine is like a tube, and so, <coughs> so here's the tube. All right, and I should have done, I'll do the bloodstream in red. All right, so here's your small intestine lining. You have your digested food. What does that mean? Proteins have digested into amino acids. Carbohydrates have digested into sugar molecules. Um, uh, and so on and so forth. So all of these things now need to get into your bloodstream. So here's a capillary, which is the smallest unit of your bloodstream where blood flows. So this is the blood flowing. And we need to get these molecules into the bloodstream. And so what happens is they have to diffuse through these cells. So when we look at the, again, the thickness of the cells surrounding these, these cells have microvilli. So the cell membrane actually goes like this. And they actually have villi on top of that and so on and so forth. So it increases the surface area, which means that more can diffuse and more can diffuse and get into your bloodstream. And so that's an example of a specialized type of cell and why not all of our skin cell does not have microvilli, but because of the purpose of the small intestine, they do have microvilli to increase surface area. All right, so, <coughs> so this we should know, phospholipid bilayer, hydrophobic tails, hydrophilic heads. Remember this word, what does this mean? This means that the molecule is part what? Part polar and part nonpolar, which is what we just wrote here. So that's the word that means that. And so, <coughs> So then you have proteins. Remember, some of them go throughout the membrane, so some of them are actually embedded. And they are also part polar and part nonpolar. And then the peripheral proteins don't go through the whole membrane, so they're weakly bound to the cell's surface and they are hydrophilic. And they're <clears throat> and so 
because some of those proteins have carbohydrate chains on them, so we call them glycoproteins. So that's what this picture is showing you. We, we talked about this when we did this before, but I'm gonna just do the dot, dot, dots here. What, what am I trying to show by putting some lines here? What am I trying to, do you think, show about the proteins? That's right. So we just wrote that the, perf the, the proteins here, the integral proteins, um, are amphipathic, which means they're part polar and part nonpolar. So therefore, just like the hydrophilic heads here, these guys are, all, this part of the protein is also hydrophilic or polar, um, and the interior is hydrophobic. And so that's what I was trying to show you here. And so, <coughs> so every molecule of proteins as well as phospholipids, that's true about so the heads and the tails. <coughs> and and um, why is it, proteins, why is it that the interior is hydrophobic and the outside is hydrophilic? What must be true about the chains of amino acids? Because remember, this protein is really a chain of amino acids here. What must be true about it? The R groups, where at? Our hydrocarbons, where at? In the middle. So in the middle here, she said the R groups of these amino acids must be hydrocarbons because hydrocarbons are nonpolar, which are hydrophobic, which then the amino acids that make up this part of the chain and this part of the chain, they're facing towards the water, so they must be polar, all right, or hydrophilic. And so, so let's look at that here. Yeah, in the interior, and then the outside part, they have to be polar. So that's, uh, whoops, I thought I had a picture. It must be, nope, it must be later on here. All right, so, <coughs> so let's write this down then. So these guys here, the R groups, are polar, for those of us there. These guys, R groups, not polar. So an example of nonpolar R groups are the hydrocarbons. And that's why that is. characteristic about the membrane is that they are fluid and so <clears throat> so if we look at just the phospholipid part of the membrane the bilayer I said it has the consistency of salad oil so it's very very fluid there's a couple of things that um, cause the membrane to be fluid and uh, can change the fluidity of the membrane so first of all fluid when we think of fluid versus solid Molecules are moving faster in which state? Fluid or solid? Fluid, fluid right? And so, <coughs> so when we look at the phospholipid bilayer, these phospholipids that are next to each other, they're not bound together. They're not, not like stuck together. They're only there um, because of the arrangement, because there's water inside and outside the cell. So that hydrophilic part arranges itself towards that water-based solution and the hydrophobic part is in the interior. So therefore, <coughs> um, they're not bound together, which means that if they're fluid, they're moving around and they can actually switch spots and move throughout the membrane. And so that's what we see here. This is called lateral movement. Um, the, notice that they're staying within the same lateral movement. They're staying within the same layer. So there's our on the, the top layer here. They rarely do this part where it flip flops or switches layers. So that's what we're at. So it's going from the top to the bottom. Look at the stats here. 10 to the seventh times per second. That's a lot in a one second time period once per month does not happen very often. Can somebody tell me why this would happen more often than this? Why would that make sense that this, this one wouldn't happen very often? Does it have to do with 
Um, just because the inside of the layer is non-polar, so like they wouldn't really, the polar heads would really be attracted to the inside, so they wouldn't want to go like flip like they do. Exactly, that's exactly right. All right, so notice here the big interior here is mostly hydrophobic tails, and so this polar part here is attracted to the water um, that's it's uh, uh, that it's surrounded by and not attracted at all to the tail so the fact that it's going to flip and go through that interior and flip to the other side highly unlikely right so it doesn't happen very often so they can move around so they're they're they're, they're literally fluid now let's talk, talk about two things that play a role in the fluidity um, and the one is unsaturated versus saturated hydrocarbon tails and the other thing is cholesterol so <clears throat> let's look at this let's look at the unsaturated so it says unsaturated hydrocarbon tails with kinks so what does that mean well, at the kink what do you what's what if you were to actually see the tails what would you see what's going on at the, the kink a double bond between the two carbons all right so that's what unsaturated double bond between the carbons and you get that kink. So therefore, this plays a role in fluidity because remember that the more fluid a uh, substance is, the farther apart the molecules are until eventually they're so far apart you can change to a gas. All right, the, then when, the, when it slows down, the kinetic, when it gets colder, kinetic energy slows down and the molecules get closer together. So the more unsaturated hydrocarbon tails you have, the more fluid the membrane is. So then they're showing you if it's all saturated, saturated is single bonds between the carbons, right? Notice here, no kinks. What does that mean? It means that these molecules can pack closer together, all right, than these molecules. This would be less, a less fluid membrane than this membrane, all right? So let me tell you a little something about some organisms. Some organisms can actually change the amount of um, unsaturated fatty acids. So winter wheat is a plant that um, grows when it's really warm outside and then continues to grow when it gets cold outside. So you have a big temperature fluctuation from hot to cold and it needs to survive um, in the cold. So the cold, what happens to kinetic energy of molecules in the cold? slows down, meaning that they can get closer together, which means that for most of us, if we go out in the cold, eventually our cell membranes would solidify. All right, it would get cold enough where the molecules, the phospholipids would get close enough together and it would solidify. That means we couldn't get things into and out of the cells and our cells would die and we would die and so on. So what um, some organisms like the winter wheat do is in the warm weather, they have more like this, all right? But as it gets colder, they actually can chemically change their fatty acids to make it so that there's more kinks, more, more double bonds. And so that makes it more fluid. And therefore, as the temperature gets colder, because there's more kinks, the molecules don't get that close together. So it still maintains its fluidity, even when the temperature outside is getting, going down. Does that make sense? All right, so they can actually adjust to that. Some organisms just have more um, unsaturated hydrocarbon tails all the time. So for instance, fish, they found fish that live in very cold waters, like in the Arctic and so on. When they look at the cell membranes, they actually all the time have way more unsaturated um, uh, hydrocarbon tails than us that don't live in that cold weather. And so, <coughs> and so they, that's uh, something naturally to help to keep their, their membrane fluid in the environment that they live in. So some organisms can change that. All right, let's look at cholesterol. So we just talked about that cholesterol is a lipid, right? And it's embedded in the membrane. So these are all these different cholesterol molecules here, these four ring, fused rings embedded in the membrane. And so, so cholesterol also plays a role in fluidity. Um, when the, under, in warmer temperatures, let's write this here, in warm temperatures, It prevents um, uh, the lipid movement. So in really warm temperatures, kinetic energy goes up, right? 
So we don't want the membrane to get too fluid and the movement to be too, so that, that it actually doesn't contain the cytoplasm and so on. So what cholesterol does is impedes the movement of these phospholipids. We talked about these phospholipids can switch around and move and so on. And so cholesterol embedded in there prevents that movement and therefore prevents the um, uh, membrane from getting too fluid. On the flip side, in, in uh, cold temperatures, I'll just put in cold temps. It prevents it from solidifying. So when it gets cold outside, molecules slow down and they pack closer together. So it prevents the phospholipids from packing too close together and therefore helps to maintain a little bit of fluidity um, even when it's cold outside. So in combination, the amount of cholesterol and the amount of saturated versus unsaturated hydrocarbons um, helps to maintain fluidity for the membrane in various conditions. All right, so we're gonna write about that. So as temperatures cool, membrane switch from fluid to solid state. That's bad news because nothing can get into and out of the cell and so therefore the cell may die. And the temperature at which it solidifies depends on the types of lipids. And what does it depend on? It depends, what about the types of lipids? What's the characteristic of a lipid? Whether or not it has double bonds or not and those, those kinks. So if the, the lipids don't have them, they will solidify at a faster rate than if they have the double bonds. So membranes rich in unsaturated fatty acids are more fluid than those rich in saturated fatty acids. And therefore, because of that, the unsaturated fatty acids, membranes that are rich in that, the temperature can fall down lower before it solidifies. And why do we care about that? Because membranes must be fluid to work properly to let things in and out. And as I said, they're fluid as, as about salad oil. And then the cholesterol, steroid, as we wrote, has different effects at different temperatures. So at warm temperatures, it says such as 37 degrees Celsius, cholesterol blank movement of phospholipids. Does it cholesterol, what does it do to the movement of phospholipids? Yeah, we could say cholesterol prevents the movement, decreases the movement, something along that line here. I put restraints, all of that. When you fill in the blank, there's lots of things that you can put in there. All right, all of that would mean the same thing. At cool temperatures, though, when it gets colder, it ma maintains blank by providing tight packing. What does it maintain? Fluidity. All right, it maintains fluidity. your lipid bilayer in the construction. Now, the next most common molecule in, besides the lipid bilayer and the cell membrane are your proteins, right? And so <coughs> you have a list of the six major functions of proteins. So you have their transport. The rest of the chapter is going to be about transport, but it also can act as enzymes or enzymatic activity. <laughs> Signal transduction, and we'll talk about each one of those. There's on the top of the next page is some pictures. Cell to cell recognition, intercellular joining, and attachment to the cytoplasm and extracellular matrix. So there are six things there, and if you turn to the top of the next page, there is a picture of six things. Those are your six um, functions, just to give you uh, a different way to look at it. So here's transport. So some proteins actually have a tunnel where things can, in this case here, move into the cell. Um, some have a shape change, that so they have a specific shape that fits with a certain molecule. 
So if you notice here, this little guy comes in and binds to that, and then with the help of energy through ATP, it'll change shape. It'll actually close on this side and open on this side and let that molecule out of the cell. And so those are our different ways of transport. We'll talk about those more specifically later on in this chapter. Sometimes they act as enzymes. What do enzymes do? Speed up chemical reactions, right? And so in this case here, you have two enzymes working together. These are two different enzymes that, um, that bind with two different molecules. So here's your chemical reaction. The beginning of a chemical reaction, you start out with your reactant, right? And the end, you end up with your products, right? So here's your reactant, here's your product. So this is a, uh, the reactant binds to this enzyme. This enzyme speeds up the reaction of turning our little triangle into a square. And then this, the square binds here and um, converts that to the another molecule represented by the circle. And so that's your complete chemical reaction. Two enzymes catalyze that or speed that up. Um, this one is the, the signaling molecule. This is like I just went over with the hormones. So this is your receptor protein. When it says signal transduction, we'll just write that a change in the cell happens. There's a whole chapter about that in chapter 11. We'll talk about it more. All right, and then cell to cell recognition. So remember I said these are your IV tags. So how do your cells know um, so, so uh, that it's part of them? The, you have the glycoprotein with the carbohydrate chain. And notice the adjacent cell has a shape that binds with that glyco, all right, um, uh, protein, and therefore recognizes it. If the glycoprotein, if there was a different chain that had a different shape or different um, monosaccharides, then they wouldn't bind together and that would tell um, that it's a foreign cell. Sometimes they join together, so you can see protein to protein, they actually join together, two cells combined there. And then we already talked about this, the extracellular matrix and the cytoplasm, and they're attached to both of those inside and outside the cell. So proteins in the membrane have a lot of different jobs. We're gonna focus on the rest of this chapter up here about transport. So this picture just shows you again, um, uh, relating back to, to chapter five, that, that they're really a chain of amino acids, these proteins, and that, remember, these guys are the polar amino acids, or I should put it right here, and these guys are nonpolar, and that it has the hydro, uh, the um, um, alpha helix and the beta pleated sheets and so on and so forth. So what kinds of things can go through the lipid bilayer? Permeability of the lipid bilayer. Hydrophobic things can't, not polar. Such as hydrocarbons can dissolve and actually move right through the lipid bilayer pretty easily. Not our polar things like sugars, as an example, don't cross the membrane very easily. <coughs> Let's talk about why that is. Let's go look at this picture here. Going back to this picture. So, we just said that nonpolar things can move through the lipobilayer, but a polar thing cannot. So the polar thing, like the sugar, can't go through the lipid bilayer. Why is that? I'm going to think of a reason why that would be, knowing what you know about the lipid bilayer. Um, because the, the heads of phospholipid are polar, so... Yes, they're polar, so they can pass the lipid the opposite. They, yeah, you're right that the heads are polar, but what did you, what was the second part? So the non-polar molecules can go through. Okay, so what does that have to do, like, I'm trying to see the connection between the non-polar molecules. Are the non-polar molecules attracted to the polar parts? So, 
but they can go through. They're not, so this is not attractive. These guys are attractive, polar to polar. These guys would be attractive, but don't, it could be attractive to the heads, but it doesn't cross the membrane. Why would the, that be, Megan? Yeah, up here you've got a bunch of polar molecules like water. Water is attracted to water, but they don't really have any attraction to nonpolar molecules, right? So the nonpolar molecules, though, can go right through the nonpolar nonpolar things and nonpolar things. Like if you mixed um, corn oil and um, uh, olive oil, they would mix together because they don't they don't they're not really attracted to each other, but they're also not opposed to each other. There's no attraction whatsoever. So therefore, nonpolar molecules can kind of go right through this whole nonpolar interior without much problem. Um, these polar molecules don't usually go through the nonpolar interior. Why? Because why would they? These polar molecules, they have a charge. They're attracted to the heads. They're attracted to the other polar water out here. So they're like acting like little magnets with all the other molecules that are polar out here. Why would they go through to something that's no charge? All right, does that make sense? And so therefore they're not attracted at all. So polar molecules don't really go through that big um, nonpolar region. And so only um, the nonpolar molecules do. So if you look at, let me if you look at this picture here, right here, that you picked up today, illustrates that. And so I just wanna, it's just another way to look at this. So what we see here, this is, it says here hydrophobic molecules. So this is what we're talking about, hydrophobic molecules. Um, and I give some examples. Notice here, this right here says artificial lipid bilayer. So this is supposed to be your lipid bilayer. And so we can see, for the reasons we just talked about, that those molecules can go right through the lipid bilayer. Why? Because they are, these guys are nonpolar. And the interior core is also nonpolar, and they can diffuse right through that lipid bilayer, no problem. All right, um, <coughs> notice here, it says, there's an exception here. They've noticed that size, makes a difference. So notice here it says small, put, highlight small, uncharged polar molecules. Um, they found that some molecules like carbon dioxide can also, if they're small enough, can actually diffuse through the lipid bilayer. I'm gonna have us cross off water though, because they have discovered that water actually cannot go through the lipid bilayer. So this shows you the science in progress that, that at one time they thought that water was small enough, even though it's polar, to get through the lipid bilayer, but that's not true um, uh, based upon uh, discovery. So, so but these guys can get through the lipid bilayer. So if they're small enough and polar, they can get through the lipid bilayer. Now notice here, large, I'm charged polar molecules. That's like I just we just wrote about the glucose, sucrose. These are your sugars. So those are your sugars. This arrow is supposed to be showing you that um, they can't get through the lipid bilayer. And then ions that are, mole are atoms with a charge also cannot because they are attracted to the water and so on. And, um, and so anything with a charge large enough, um, ions are small with the charge is so great on them that they do not go through the lipid bilayer. And so how do you suppose that these guys get into and out of the cell, the large uncharged polar molecules? Because we know for sure glucose needs to get into our cells because we use glucose for energy to make ATP. It's really important that glucose gets into our cells, but it can't get through the lipid bilayer. So we go through the transport they go through the transport proteins. And so therefore, um, uh, these guys here, let's write down. These guys may go through the transport proteins. And I had us cross off 
water. Well, I'm going to add here, down here, water. Water can't go through the lipid bilayer, but what, so I'm going to add that to that. These guys go through transport proteins called, they call them aquaforms.